Siegel Talks here at the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan at the City University and another day um, on uh, planet Earth. It all looks uh, nice and sunny if you look outside, but uh, still we are in the middle of a Corona crisis. Well, it looks like, as we heard yesterday in Germany from the great Susanne Kennedy, who talked to us about her her work, her research, about the virtual realities and how it's connected to Chekhov's Three Sisters and her robot uh, uh, Oracle play that is inspired by Greece and uh, tries to find a way to meditate and to rethink what we are doing. And she said their theaters have opened in a way. She had her first opening again and she thinks it's behind them here in America, of course. We are in the middle of it and somehow have the feeling it's the beginning, Florida especially, but also California. Good news for us at the university, foreign students, international students can come, can stay. It was a sham. It was a terrible and reckless suggestion from this administration that mishandled so, so very much. And luckily we have artists uh, with us who um, see um, the present, are in the present, have been on the right side of social justice, the complex struggle for freedom and liberties, and um, always uh, been on the side of a social uh, progress. Um, normally and always, as we do, we go around the world. This week, we focus a little bit back again of New York. Often we have four, three, four internationals, but this time we have a, a, a view on the New York. Ping Jong uh, joined us on Monday. Uh, Caridad Switch will be with us um, on Friday. Um, tomorrow, Tiago Rodriguez from Portugal, a great director, will talk to us. But with us today, we have uh, two legends of the New York theater. Um, people who belong to the landscape uh, and are part of uh, uh, the Grand Canyons, if you would say so. As a, and uh, it's uh, Lee Brewer from the Marble Mines and Maud Mitchell, both of them together, a couple, a creative couple, like by the way, so many also we had here was from around the world. Seems to be something to, to, to work together and that works. And uh, both of them um, have uh, done a tremendous uh, work and we're gonna hear from them today a bit. How do they experience Corona? How was it? Uh, where were they when it happened? And uh, what is on their minds? And um, I'm gonna read a little bit. M most of you already know who they are, but Maud Mitchell, who is an artistic associate of Mabu Minds, he's an actor, dramaturg and an adapter. She had Drama League nominations, uh, Village Voice Obie Award for playing in the legendary uh, Mabu Mines dollhouse. Many people argue, and I think I would agree, most probably no production of dollhouse in the history of theater has traveled so much, not even the Schaubühne, the great Ostermeyer one. Um, even so, I do prefer the Mabu Mines version. It's perhaps the best adaptation I have seen in my lifetime. And they traveled to 33 venues on five continents and um, and uh, for over two decades, she's collaborating with Lee Brewer and uh, many, many others. And they have been um, around the world. Lee Brewer is uh, uh, Chevalier des Arts, a letter from France, something I would love to have, but only special people like Lee uh, have that. He's a MacArthur Fellow and he's a writer, director, a poet, lyricist, filmmaker, adapter, producer, and a teacher who expands the boundaries of storytelling in theater. He's the founding artistic director of Mabu Minds. His work with the Gospel of Colonus is uh, what I mean, an unprecedented merger of Greek theater and gospel service and whoever saw it uh, knows so how, what a an fantastic and great work that is that perhaps it's one of the few things that comes close to Bryce Three Penny Opera where we had a critical success, a musical, but also aesthetically and theater uh, people loved it. It's uh, play. He's a theater maker's theater maker. So um, of course his Mabu Mines dollhouse is a, a, a must see for everybody. I'm not sure if it's online at these times. And um, he is also uh, has publications with a TCG, Theater Communication Group, so La Divina Caricatura, the Bunraku meets downtown and uh, getting off. And uh, he is one whose very early work goes back to the Berliner Ensemble which he visited. So um, I apologize uh, for, 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 for our speaking uh, so much. It's really about listening to you. We want to hear what's on your mind. We need to hear from artists, not just from the politicians, economists, and virologists. Artists' voices are significant. They uh, create uh, what we now see is missing. 
life, uh, the experience of life, the deep experience of, and the possibility for a change, for a change of perception of our virtual headsets, uh, which dream like we put everything together. As Thomas Metziger, the German philosopher says, who was quoted by Susanna Kennedy yesterday. So Lee and Maud, how are you? Where are you? And um, I don't know, maybe Lee, you start off. Where are you? We are in Brooklyn. Yeah. And uh, I think the easiest way to say it is, is the beginning of retirement to try to figure out a little bit about what retirement really is. I think I have to be a speak louder. I, I couldn't fully hear. Yeah. Uh, I was saying uh, that I think the uh, the thing to think about for me is uh, morality. Uh, I feel that it's a very, very interesting time to feel out the uh, zeitgeist of the world morally and uh, all of these things that have gone so long unquestioned in the United States to be questioned finally. I think it's a fantastic thing that's developing at this point that it's a little bit of a, a house cleaning, but at this point it's kind of that stage in cleaning where everything gets dirtier. And I think it'll get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier and hope the cleaning will come after all of this uh, muck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty interested in this particular time. I think there's elements of it that are, there's a lot to think about. You've got he helicopters. Right, we're helicopter. in the middle of <laughs> <laughs> helicopter city here. Is it uh, demonstration or? I, you know. They're guarding the Brooklyn Bridge <laughs> as usual. Uh, I think that what's special about this time, Frank, is that you can feel the events take form. You can feel them come into a kind of a physical reality. Uh, I think the demonstrations have been amazing. And I think that the effort to change the social structure seems to be deepening and deepening and deepening. Uh, hopefully, it will achieve something. It will not be bought off as usual. But I think that uh, this looks like it has a chance. There's so much going on and it's so chaotic. Uh, so much, from the, there are so many factions and the factions are so aggressive toward each other. It's uh, people are fighting their personal wars and they're fighting their personal wars in social media and in theater. Uh, everybody has, they're selling something. They're selling, you know, there's something you begin to understand about this country that it's all about selling. Uh, you can't stop selling yourself. You can't stop selling your point of view uh, and you can't stop the people that feel that since everything is for sale, all they have to do is amass amounts of money and they buy it. So pretty soon you're a bot person. Uh, Mon and I have gone through a lot of evolutions here to try to avoid being bought people. Uh, our work at Mabu is an attempt to stay uh, above the market in that sense. Uh, I feel that it's uh, been a, a, a somewhat successful battle so far, but it's something that takes every ounce of your energy all the time. That uh, it's a great big whirlpool. You can get caught up in it at any time. It's, uh, and it's a personal whirlpool uh, it's, you have to not only resist being bought, you have to resist being want to be bought. It's, uh, it's time to come to terms with 
your kind of emotional and spiritual reality. I feel that it's a moment to be reckoned, to uh, to come to terms with what we're doing on Earth, who we are, what kind of animals we are, uh, and how to contain ourselves, how to put ourselves in a proper zoo. <laughs> the uh, The, the world outside is shocking. I don't think there is any dearth of material. I think it's just all material. It's all spilling out. It's kind of like a volcano erupting. And uh, it's very exciting in many ways. And But the, I think the safest thing, of course, is to be an observer and to try to track and to... Uh, figure out what's happening and how our path is good to wind between the various pitfalls. You know what it's like? It's kind of like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, you walk down the path and you see press over high and the potentiality for publicity, the potentiality for uh, enhancing one's career, enhancing one's voice. Uh, it's, uh, there's almost something in this Pilgrim's Progress that says, where is the cry for simplicity? Where is the cry to settle back, to stay at ease, to observe, to keep one's balance? Uh, I think that's the big fellow today just keep one's balance in the middle of all of these uh, conflicting slough of demands, despair. demands. The slough of despair. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I, I love Bunyan and I would, <laughs> I would see, I like to see my life metaphorically uh, and I like to see moments in it where I'm in different classics of literature and I think at this particular moment I'm in Pilgrim's Progress and looking Pilgrim's for progress, yeah. mm -hmm. looking for the path looking for the narrow gate and uh, trying to find how and where and what kind of salvation lies and what point of compass uh, I think it's a very confusing time, but a very exciting time. And I believe that the massive destruction from the virus is part of uh, an Armageddon. Uh, you know, it's, it's time to think about a lot of the world, end of the world prophecies. Uh, I certainly think it's time to think of the end of the theater prophecies. And uh, I appreciate so much everyone's efforts to get moving again, to have performances again, to come back into the, um, I was gonna say trough. Uh, but I think it's maybe the best time is to try to walk along the edge, to try to uh, look down, observe, and see what the grand metaphor is. Uh, so it's that's where I'm at, <laughs> looking at trying to figure out how to look at things, and how to look at things in my metaphors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So looking at the the abyss mode. How how is the moment for you? I think, um, you know, it keeps uh, shifting. And, uh, but initially, as you can tell, we, we have been, and I have been thinking a lot about end of life issues and mortality for some time now. Uh, uh, Lee was diagnosed with stage four, uh, 
kidney disease back in the fall of 2013. But then two years ago in the summer of 2018, that shifted to uh, stage five. And uh, this country has very much incentivized uh, dialysis care and um, which is very big business, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar business. There's a lot of racial and uh, food injustice issues around kidney disease. Um, and we chose uh, not to pursue dialysis, but to try um, and manage it um, palliatively or conservatively conservatively. Other countries like New Zealand and Australia and Canada and the UK are, um, Europe are ahead of the US in that. And it's not a lot of data in some ways about the best way to proceed, but I think doing very well and uh, all things considered. Uh, and last year, not knowing that this was going to happen, we tried to say yes to as much as we could say yes to that came our way. So we were very fortunate. I mean, Lee was honored in a few situations and we were able to travel to uh, the Cairo festival. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was very meaningful to me because uh, my parents lived in Cairo for five years in the early eighties and then in Yemen for three years. and. Uh, I've been to Cairo a number of times. So, and I think the last time we'd been to it was 28, 2008 before that. So that the ability to still like um, our work and our lives have always been fueled by that kind of travel and interaction with artists. And then we were, we were, we accepted an invitation to go give a small presentation in, uh, in Oxford also. And it's that kind of funny thing we we saw our next door neighbor at the British Museum looking at the um, um, Assyrian collection, and I saw an old college uh, friend who at Oxford we just bumped into him by random. He was a, the scholar there, but then this year things pulling in and. Um, at first, initially, that actually felt good to be in line with here, we've been thinking about mortality and how to help somebody on their journey at the end. And then it felt like the whole world was thinking about that in a way. Mm -hmm. And the, the quiet for a while was quite beautiful that you could hear the birds sing again and this neighborhood can be very quiet now it's not i'm sorry all the helicopters uh but i think then the chance to take a deeper breath and but now as things both start up again, but we also understand that this is really just the beginning of a very long road. Um, we've been listening to and reading like Laurie Garrett who talking about, you know, we're really looking at three years or more, I think, uh, or that this is just a, things will not be the same. Um, and there's a sense now of being in this, we've always been good in small spaces. We've lived in, this has been our base. We're very lucky uh, for 20 years, but we've come and gone. I don't think we've ever been in one. We've never been here this long before and it's a studio. And because Lee is very high risk, I just feel like there's a loss of autonomy I don't want him to go take the garbage out or, and we have to come down in the elevator, which I feel like is the elevator stands between us and the outside world. And I know we're a great deal more fortunate that, and many, many, but I keep on turning over in my mind, how do you, um, 
where do we go from here and what will this be like six months from now or or a year from now and 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 if we end up enrolling in hospice here what will that be like you know um so there are some things that uh, uh we haven't watched a lot online or things like that i think that what feeds us more is we've gone back to our bookshelves and we also have one of those little free libraries in the in the neighborhood one of those little boxes so there's that random surprise of that's where sort of the fiction tends to come from, but other things too, or people have sent us books and there's a pleasure in that. Um, uh, you know, some of those questions, are you still an artist if you don't make art? Uh, I got these wonderful uh, solar powered um, rainbow makers and they have been like, because they, it's, every day it shifts and the, the room becomes full of, you can see we don't have things on the wall, but the, the, the light reflected is stunning. Sometimes we try to take a walk each day for exercise and sometimes I'm like, we have to go back, it's the rainbow out. Um, I, you know, sometimes things feel, uh, I think initially we, we try, I tried to pull back and look at this historically. So I read a lot about 1918, it didn't seem like enough. I had to pull back further and I, you know, reread the, A Distant Mirror and thinking about the Black Death and didn't feel like enough and pull back and start reading about the six extinctions and mm -hmm. dinosaurs and that seemed more helpful in the long, long stretch of things. So I think I lost the thread of what you asked me. <laughs> but, so I'm here and I think like a lot of people, some days we're fine and some days not so fine. <laughs> hmm. Frank, kind of what I find is that uh, I'm happiest if I can live a period of time within a metaphor that I'm interested in. Hmm. And uh, I was looking around for the right one for me now and dying seems to be it. So, <laughs> <laughs> is that a metaphor? Yeah, that a metaphor? I, think, <laughs> I think the more I can understand the world in terms of dying, the better and the more interesting it can be for me. Hmm. Uh, I. Or to get interested in the present state and turn it into a metaphor and in, the, sure. in that way, I think. To, to... Uh, the, uh... Sorry. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I know <laughs> I interrupted you. You were talking about a metaphor and to lean into the... To, to... No, I was talking about a way of coming to terms with what I feel just walking out on the street. Uh, Looking at one another. I feel a tremendous amount of anger out there. And I feel that uh, my own anger can react sympathetically with this anger. I feel that, you know, much of the world and the interaction of human beings in it, the theater of it, is disgusting. Uh, this is. Uh, <laughs> the uber of our times. Uh, I feel that uh, that I need to find an emotional response to everything that I believe in and that I can build on. And anger is half of it. The other half is uh, a, a perspective for anger that uh, it I really feel that this is one of the problems with seeing all of this turmoil around us in the streets and things like that that there is the anger but it's hard to find a perspective on it and I think that a combination of thinking on both sides 
is most interesting at this particular point for me. Uh, I don't feel that I understand very much of what's going on. I had a lot to do with the black community when I was working with Vasco uh, Colonis, but little by little, I'm learning about what I don't know. I only knew a part of the black community. I was very familiar with the church community. I wasn't very familiar with the uh, uh, the sports community, the rock and roll community. Uh, it's uh, it's fascinating to see that you know how our minds get divided and uh, the perspectives get forced upon us. That we look at things from our own experience. And I'm looking at stuff from the church experience that I had in Gospel of Colonus, and which was critically important to me. And I'm trying to see that as proliferating in the rest of Black Anger at this point. And uh, I don't quite see it all. So there's so much that I don't understand. And I kind of, rather than rushing in and trying to take part, I, I want to sit back and understand a little bit, stand back and understand. And, uh, and for me, it's understanding the, uh, the, I mean, I, my childhood was in Hong Kong and Tallahassee, Florida during the early years of integration. And I spoke to a lot of prejudice, um, seeing uh, racism and action lived on a street in which all the houses flew the stars and bars. Uh, fled that world, didn't want to look back. Um, the other day when uh, NASCAR took down the Confederate flag, I, I, what a sea change to see that in your life. Oh. I understand what that means. It's enormous. What I didn't realize was the really systematic economic structures in place, but the structures in place for economic exploitation. And uh, I almost feel now like we were talking about the other day, and I said, I just feel like the the color of the skin is just a, it was just a pretext for uh, how you choose the group that you're going to enslave. Um, it's really this desire for human beings to separate into those who can enslave and those who end up being enslaved. And how convenient that there was a color, uh, but that it came on top of that, just when you look at so many levels of slavery around the world and through history. Anyway, uh, it's, it's marvelous to see that the lid come off and the light come in and... Well, the big thing is, is the light coming in after the lid is coming off? A little bit of it, a little bit. Well, I, you know, take myself as an example because I say, well, how naive of I yeah. that I, I thought I've learned that it so was much fundamentally over the last, yeah. the last period, a uh, period of unrest. Uh, yeah, I am absolutely shocked at what a pile of shit this country is, actually, <laughs> and the behaviors in it. Uh, I'm totally shocked and, uh, you know, worried about making a gesture, making a statement, thinking, oh my, white, white boy, what do you have to say? And uh, uh, yeah, I did my bit. I, I tried to be a good person and do a good piece of work with Gospel Polonis, but uh, I don't know. There's a, there's another end to it. Uh, 
I need to sit back and examine that whole process, what happened with that project, why I felt it was important, why I feel now that it was the center of my life for a long period of time and how I related to the black community. Um, it's, uh, it's a mind boggling project. You just. <laughs> and, and, and for me, that piece was Dollhouse where I feel like I grew up with her and had this opportunity to come into my own voice as an artist. What was interesting about being in Cairo was that in 2008, the film was shown mm -hmm. as part of the official festival offerings. And the presenter that, in the early 80s, you know, there was not this ubiquitous headscarf. There was a more of a secular uh, divide. And the young, it was very well attended and there were a lot of young women who were indeed wearing headscarves. This is 2008. And I felt the presenter really pushed people, uh, translated several times into Arabic that there was nudity in the piece. And I felt like pushed the young women out. Um, they wanted to see it. Uh, and then, and at that time, there had only been um, two other productions of Dollhouse in Egypt um, just that year, uh, various adaptations. So now here we are uh, 11 years later and both the State Department, uh, the American Embassy who are just under siege, you know, because the Trump administration just gutted the State Department. So we gave a presentation there and then we gave presentations through the festival and they all asked for clips beforehand to censor them and they returned clips to us and they said, we cannot show this, we will, you know, we cannot, we just cannot show. Um, had to be so careful to pick things that wouldn't uh, put them in jeopardy. Uh, and there was a different kind of agitation on the streets, of course. Um, and there were times when we were out, I mean, we were very well cared for and very protected, but there, we had wanted to walk in a few places. And of course, we attracted a lot of attention in some of the areas. And our, we were accompanied by someone who said, I'm, I'm telling them that you're English, that you're from the UK. Please don't contradict me. Um, I said, don't worry, I won't. <laughs> don't worry, I won't. Yeah, too, yeah. American artists have to hide that they're from America. Yeah, yeah. Show yeah. their work in yeah. the world. What do you guys think about theater now? Is your perspective changing? What you've been both made such great contributions and work. What do you think about the in general and, and in this time? What is the connection? I think when when live performances resume, I think there's going to be a real thirst for them, a real hunger for them. Um, <clears throat> for now, I, I think it's great to experiment and try these different modes. Although I see in, in Europe that they're able to do street theater now in certain places. Uh, but um, I'm not drawn to this form because uh, for, for me as a performer, there's something um, I like laughter and I like to hear that, but what I really like as a performer is when the, the, the sort of a change in the density of the air in the room. I get, there's that sense of that quiet, of the attentiveness that, and, and the visceral connection between the other actors. So I think in that way, it's an opportunity to think about what you, 
what excites one about theater, what what the 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 deep connect is with theater. Um, but it's certainly, I think it's going to require a lot of patience and resourcefulness for before it resumes. And I, I just might. We also are waiting with bated breath to see what's going to happen to the unemployment uh, extension here in this country. Um, hard times. But I, I think in the longer view, I think that there will be a, 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 a kind of a replenishment. Um, I'm sure now for several years, there will just be more um, filmification of theater, more you know, more zooming, more zooming, more <laughs> electronic. But I think uh, there's also someone just recently asked me would I participate in sort of a, a, a one of those pieces that are one on one audience member, one performer, short piece, ten minutes. I'm curious to try. We you know with a plexiglass in between. I'm curious to try to see how much of a connection you can you can get. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so they'll be, I, I think, I, I imagine also when things start up again, uh, that they will start small and maybe more community based. Um, that's where I'm thinking. You? Well, I think small just always mean community based. I mean, I keep harking back to when I started to work in theater in San Francisco a long, long time ago. And what, what, what the problems that did not exist is you just, well, financially, the whole thing was on a different foot. Uh, people got together within the atmosphere of a kind of like a jam session. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to express themselves. They did it almost privately and uh, this was at the moment that performance art was being born and that uh, uh, I think what later became experimental theater was yeah, just- Talk just a little louder because of the helicopter. What later became experimental theater was becoming uh, more present. And it's where my tradition began. Uh, I, Feel very nostalgic for this, but there were very deep problems. For example, all of us had separate jobs, and none of us actually uh, looked to theater for a living. And we were all very young and healthier, and <laughs> we didn't have to uh, conserve our energy at that point. Uh, I think I'm rather unhappy with the, uh, the monetization of everything in the theater itself, everything that's now cost so much and uh, cost so much to see, cost so much to do, that it, uh, it kind of puts up a barrier to any kind of thinking. Uh, it's easier to think on a piece of paper. So I, I feel that uh, that's what you're doing these days. Writing is the way out. Uh, I just don't really feel that I want to put another ounce of energy into raising more money for anything. I am so sick to hell of raising money for things, of begging people for money, of, uh, well, yeah. it's, uh, that's it. I'm just sick and tired of the money equation. And I worry, because I do think for theater makers, there's theater viewers and theater makers, but especially for, for, for young people and young kids, I think there's a period of time when it is about self-expression. It's a, it's a means, you're attracted to it because it, for many people can save their lives. And it's like, so I think about school programs and I worry that those budgets will just be slashed and burnt because except I, someone invited me to um, be on a sort of a chat the other night with some small theaters in uh, 
the Northeast and they're doing a circus program uh, with like 200 kids on Zoom. Uh, and I was like, wow, what, what can that, what's that like? And they said that the kids are really participating. And so that felt hopeful to me um, because I think that um, that's where you get the next generation of people who are drawn to connecting and creating theater. Mm. Mm. How important was the, I, I remember you once talked about, you've been so many times to the Siegel, but about the Berliner Ensemble and you were there early on. Tell us, was that formative? Was this your guiding spirit next to the San Francisco work? It was critical. Uh, we went to visit the Berliner Ensemble when we were located in Paris. And uh, I feel that it was transformative. I remember that we lived in a, a little kind of bed and breakfast temporarily just uh, on the other side of Checkpoint Charlie. And we would go through Checkpoint Charlie and sneak stuff in for the different people in Berlin or Ensemble that wanted them. You said records Beatles records. And, yeah, Beatles records, <laughs> things like that. It was, uh, we were received like family. Uh, and uh, we were invited to attend rehearsals. Uh, I got many of my original directorial ideas observing the process of the Berliner Ensemble. I remember, you know, the idea of multiple direction. Uh, we were watching rehearsals of Manist Man, and I was absolutely astounded by the fact that there was a head director and there were four or five underling directors, all of whom were watching different actors in a chorus. And then there would be large discussions afterwards. It was tremendously open. Uh, Vago was still alive and it was, uh, she was the mother of us all and it was really pretty exciting. Uh, the, uh, you worked with Helena, you saw Helena Weigel work and- uh, yeah. yeah, I saw her doing uh, Korea Lansk. Uh, and uh, it was pretty exciting. We've been uh, an old friend of ours, uh, Tony Makochi, who used to be a uh, city center and also was Lee's manager and book dollhouse. And he's come back into our, our lives to help uh, spearhead putting together Lee's archives and getting them placed. And it's been, uh, I, you have always said to me, you need to have five balls in the air at all time because you never know which one's going to drop. And um, so looking at this huge body of work. Incredible, yeah. And how many projects didn't come to, we, you know, we of course fasten on the ones that make it out of the gate and into the world, um, but so many projects that were, only made it to X stage of development or, and it might've been some years of development and then, but I think that they find their way into other pieces, but there's, there's a, a maybe twenty five percent of the projects uh, undone, incompleted, unfinished, uh, and there's something actually in encouraging about that to understand that because um, you can't control all the elements, you can't control whether or not. Uh, mm -hmm. they I think come what's out. to go back to the Berlin Ensemble, yeah. what. Uh, it was exciting as certain images that stay with you. Mm. I remember watching uh, Omar Tati and uh, Eckhart. Eckhart Scholl uh, at that point. Uh, Helmer was doing uh, Goebbels and uh, he uh, was singing a song and he was in the boxes uh, and he uh, hooked his legs over the edge of the box and leaned over backwards so he became a gargoyle. 
<laughs> and he sang it as a gargoyle. It was absolutely thrilling. <laughs> I just, but these are images that stay with me, uh, you know, mm -hmm. 20, 30 years after I've seen them. And they are the critical ones. Seeing um, Hamartati's gargoyle was just, uh, I will never, ever forget it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, yeah. I mean, that is uh, it's stunning to think that you starting in San Francisco, uh, con you went on your own to the Berlin Ensemble, you directed the Comédie Française, uh, there's a space named after you guys at PS1, or the old PS122, now the performance space. Um, you know, still, um, New York didn't perhaps produce you uh, as the way it, a New York artist of your your career and caliber should be, and now it's shut down in COVID. What What are your thoughts on on theater in New York City at the moment? What do you What do you think the about? The thought is it's good to be rich. <laughs> it would be nice to have been rich because I think that would have changed the ball game. Uh, but only... that just would have been a very different path for you because there's there's I, I I. Well, it would have been the path that makes it impossible to understand Black Lives Matter because I understood. I understand that on the level of being poor, along with most of the black lives that do matter. And I feel an identification financially with that particular movement. I understand what it is to be poor and... Uh, and the, tra well, and the travel really cool. that fed us when we would have uh, work someplace and then we would try and take a little trip, but that was all backpacking. It was all like... Uh, and there you have a different, very different experience. I, I have no doubt that if you had more resources, you would have traveled, but the travel would have been very different. I yeah, there were things been... I would have, for example, when I got tied into Kudiyatlam in uh, India uh, with uh, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, hmm? Sorry. Oh. Bob no, Cohen, yeah, uh, no. it was critical to understand that this was a theater that kept its pristine quality by uh, hiding inside the Brown community, uh, being a church theater. Uh, and uh, when it came out in the world, it was uh, an amazing experience to see it because it was unchanged for 2,000 years. Uh, the uh, the travels were absolutely, you know, critical in terms of my understanding of what I wanted to say, what I wanted to do. I learned so much in India and so much in Europe. It was pretty amazing. I uh, I'm also learning a great deal in America at this point, and. What I'm learning is, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> it's uh, incredibly seductive, but it's it's not a seductive that, uh, seduction that I feel I can be part of or that I can receive uh, I'm, without resisting. The... Uh, I keep thinking it's kind of like uh, a big Alcoholics Anonymous meeting where everybody wants to get up and talk about their lives and talk about this, and talk about that. In other words, it's an ego blowout. Uh, there is absolutely uh, no real interest in anybody else or anything else other than the self. And uh, everybody wants their five minutes. Uh, I think <laughs> Andy Warhol had it locked when he called it the 15 minutes of fame. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting, interesting thing to try to understand capitalism. It's terrifying in a way. And uh, I think... Uh, as terrifying as anything else we have that is organizing our whole system. 
the idea of existing in the world as it stands, the idea that it's you have to trade, you have to produce, and you have to sell and buy is just well, it's disgusting. Like a different model. It's like a different model. <laughs> the uh, so I'm always kind of when I try to hear the sincerity of the different positions in the politics that's going on now. It's interesting to try to figure out how much is salesmanship, how much is publicity, hung, hunger. Uh, and how much is the truth? How much is it really important to you? And how much do you just want to get your face on camera? It's, it's a hard choice. We've been spending a lot of time in a small space talking. <laughs> 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 Lee, what, what was for you the... Um... What was for you the uh, the essential? What, what when you did theater and you did so great the back hits the early work we, we screened a little bit. I saw that of the screenings again. What what were you trying to do? What was important to you, or is? Well, my friend John, who came up with the metaphor of the jam session, pretty much hit it. I wanted to get this feeling of everyone contributing their melody to a larger whole and that there would be a form that would arise from it. Uh, I think music is the key to it. I think that if we can feel all the currents, political, Aesthetic, uh, uh, are, are joining together to make a statement that, and you can discern what that statement is, that you will have achieved a tremendous revelation about what our times and what our lives now are all about. That you have to listen hard and you have to look at things and it takes time and it takes leisure. So most of us are prevented from doing this by the fact that we have the task of making a living, the task of supporting people. And I have five children and I know a little bit about that. Uh, it doesn't make for a kind of a philosophical overview. It doesn't allow for that. It embeds you inside the turmoil. I think looking on top, getting on top, watching it as a whole is the most exciting thing I can do at this particular point. So I've been trying to read a little bit and think a little bit but just basically look and feel what's going on outside. Because even before this year, we had been talking about how it seemed to be in the last couple of years preceding it, that we were spending more and more time trying to find the money for the pieces and uh, dealing with logistics and less time as theater creators or yeah, creative time. Begging people for money is the, the biggest waste of time in the world for a creative person. So there was just less, mm -hmm. less satisfaction that way. But I wanted to say in terms of what Lee, uh, what you, your jam session, that from a performer's point of view, I think that's why it's a, a particular kind of satisfaction, like a deep satisfaction to be in one of Lee's pieces because one, he builds the part on the performers, on the particular skills and encourages a voice. 
So you feel like your voice is heard and amplified. And then- yeah, a strong concept for one, one is always soloing. Yeah, you take, yeah. And so it's just a solo. But just at the solo. same time though, you feel like you're part of a larger whole and there's this <laughs> transcendence that can happen. And that I think is this deep desire for a lot of artists. I, I think that's at the core is that you, I you want to transmogrify. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that's why some of the pieces that uh, Lee has done have these long lives because you, the performers come back to that piece because there's something deep that gets expressed for them that doesn't necessarily happen in all modes of work or theater, which have different kind, you know, may call and deliver different kinds of satisfaction okay. to audiences. The other thing is the, the constant search for a metaphor. And the one I found was working in met animal metaphor a lot. Uh, I did a lot of work, you know, spinning off of the metaphors of animals. Uh, the red horse animation, the Bee beaver animation, check the dog animation. And, uh, but I feel it permeates everything I'm doing that I just keep seeing everybody <laughs> <laughs> seeing animals. Uh, I kind of wanted to do all the classics as apes. Uh, I, in the recent thing that we did in the Tennessee Williams place piece, uh, I had a couple of apes because I had some ape costumes. And uh, it was wonderful because- I know McGann found those ape costumes. Uh, it's <laughs> a, a very Brechtian idea in that the uh, Morgan ape costume would alienate uh, the, uh, the moment, uh, particularly if an ape was playing Hamlet or an ape was playing uh, some exciting classic. Uh, but we had an ape do ballet. Uh, I feel that <laughs> that Brecht had some of the best ideas about how to set up a uh, a double view of all realities, a view in which we see the image and in which we see the context and how we try to put them together and they don't always fit a little bit. I would love to do more work with uh, these vape costumes. They were very exciting and <laughs> they meant a lot of meaning to me. Uh, that was McGann George who sadly died too young last year. Costumer who had costumed many of these pieces. Many, many um, of the pieces. Yeah, I, I do remember uh, when you once talked about the dollhouse and there was also the great Ostermeyer production, which I also like very much from the show, you know, but the different approaches uh, that you went to the original Norwe Norwegian language, tried to find the strangest, obscure translation that is close to the strangeness of the world. And then you did something with it, something different, you know, with the whimsical set design, with the, the small little person playing Tor. Meanwhile, the Berlin Ensemble made a modern adaptation, and the Schaubühne made a uh, modern la adapt language adaptation, and the rest of it was a joint, and this and that. And the setting was a realistic Bauhaus. So it, it could not be more opposite. So your dramaturgical ideas, and they worked so beautiful in that also mod oh. scenes. So um, tell us a bit, when you, when you look at theater, what do you see? <laughs> Well, I have a preconception and that image in my mind. And then I look to see how close the theater is to my preconception and where it differs. I, I, it's always a comparison. I feel that my preconception 
is what I want to happen on stage. And uh, then what happens on stage is always a version or a reversion or a contradiction of what is going on in my mind. Uh, so I always have this dialectic uh, about what I want to have happen and what is happening. And what I see in theater is it always poses this kind of dialectical problem of are you really observing or are you observing a transmutation uh, it just doesn't always seem to be that the theater that you see is the theater that's there in front of you I think the theater that you see is you're in your head and what's there in front of you is a critique perhaps of the theater that's in your head so I do feel that Brecht had a great deal to teach this way about observing the dichotomy of thoughts and realities. And I really feel that uh, I learned the most there. We got the dollhouse image from uh, a production that I saw at the ensemble at that particular point. Uh, the, uh, I remember Eckhart Scholl and Helmut Tati were both in it and they were the two shortest actors on stage and uh, the entire army surrounding them were all six feeters and they all had football helmets on and they had shoulder pads they were monstrous, the soldiers. And I just thought instantly I could make the transference that if power was related to size, if the shortest people were the most powerful, if they were the officers, this is in Gorilla, that we could do the same thing with gender. And lo and behold, out of that came the concept of the uh, small male large female uh, images. What I liked about what happened was that you could tell what the piece was about by just looking at the cast photo. You could see them. There was Torvald here, and there was Nora here, and the maid was the biggest people, the biggest person on stage. Uh, it was about a transmutation of the ideas of power to size in reverse. And a simple equation like that produced so many ramifications that we had a great play. And we had something that was really meaningful to so many people worldwide, because you could just see if the little person is the most powerful because they're the littlest, then we have an equation that's going to go someplace. So this is how Dalhouse began. And uh, I very, very appreciative what I learned from the Blair Ensemble. I learned the most there. What What should theater artists keep in mind from, from your body of work, both of you, of course, but also Lee, of your experience, if they go back, if there is a TAC, a time after Corona, what lessons from what you learned in your work life, you know, they, they, they should keep in mind. What do you think will work? What will be a strong, a strong, format uh, uh, that, that could respond to the time we live in because we... You know, that's an enormous question. I, I wait for them to answer it <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know what they should take from my work. Uh, I hope they take this idea of a balance between uh, conflicting metaphors. Uh, I hope they take this, I kind of think of, it's always possible to see a theatrical moment 
in terms of a scale that if you put so much weight here, then the balance is going to shift back and forth like this. Uh, I remember that when I was working on uh, one piece, I kind of wanted to put a balance between a Disney interpretation and a metaphysical interpretation so that there would always be a little bit of a shoot. Uh, I think if I'm able to hit this balance, I feel the moment is realized. Uh, the idea of trying for this balance, I think, is what I have to offer. That it's a way of looking up and down at the same time. Mm. It's a way of uh, seeing theater as a royal plaything and as something up in the street at the same time. It's uh, it's a big long parade, uh, and what we want to see pass in front of us are the different some schools that you would see in Brazil, and uh, you always have every theatrical dance and every theatrical moment, it's always, it comes and it goes and it passes and you catch it as it passes. Uh, I feel that I'm part of this parade and I have to be caught in passing. And uh, sometimes I'm caught and sometimes people are having smoke when I'm going by and they <laughs> missed it. But the one thing I don't want to be trapped in is being observed and negated by a kind of a preordained observation. Uh, people who think they know what I'm about and they think they know what I'm trying to say but they don't quite get it. I feel that uh, when I offer something, it's like I'm on a pulpit and it's like I'm preaching. And it's very easy not to listen to the preacher. <laughs> it's very easy to sneak out of the church, but I would love it if I was able to hold the attention of the whole congregation very briefly. Uh, whether it's with animal metaphors or whether it's with my balance theory, uh, I just think that if I have something to say, somebody will hear it. And if I don't, it's better that nobody hears it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would just add to that that sometimes when someone has a very large body of work, there's a piece or here, uh, several pieces that emerge, but it's not one piece. It's, it's, it's hard to see the whole. Mm -hmm. And also one of the things that of course was reinforced to me through those years of touring with Dollhouse which I hadn't thought about a lot beforehand, but um, when you have the opportunity to do something again and again, that it's not one night um, that you can't. That's why we return to the theater, that one, one seeing one night. I'd always thought that that was, I was like, why do people go back and see the same piece again and again? But especially it was somebody like Lee's who, whose work is not fixed because there are such variations, sometimes very large and sometimes subtle. Um, as we're looking at the archival footage for, well, Dollhouse is an example, but also something like Red Beads, which we came across a tape from 1982 that was like a fully realized 
workshop with a, uh, William Spencer was the composer who you were working with at the time who's since died. He's out in Seattle. Um, and then you didn't, he didn't pick it up again, return to it again until the uh, late nineties. And then it didn't come to the skirball until 2005. Through that piece, you see so many variants and such a, um, you see elements that work their way into other pieces, but like there's in, in the 1982 version, there's a little house that gets played like a piano. Um, I think of Peter and Wendy, but I think of Dollhouse. Uh, I guess this is, a, we had spoken to um, the head BAM archivist and she's one of those people who, she's so in the right job. And she was talking about how she was so glad that we were doing this work now and not waiting until uh, Lee was not able to participate because she's like, don't think of it as dusty work that you have to detail this or detail that. She says, you don't know what will happen as to your own work now and to your ideas about your work. Uh, it's an opportunity to go back and to, to try and thread your path through 60 years of work um, is who knows what the thinking will be at the other end of it. Where will the archive go to BAM or? Um, right now it's uh, Yale that's uh, uh, interested. They, we had spoken with them right before. We were lucky with the last people that they spoke with before everything shut down, but that we don't know when they'll acquisitions will. Uh, she had recommended uh, Yale as the way, now I know more about archives than I ever understood before, about collections talking to one another. And um, it seemed, uh, and we loved the archivists that we met with. They were quite wonderful too. Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. I'm surprised. There have been some moving things like, uh, one of Lee's oldest friends uh, from college, was it also high school? Don? Yeah. Who died, uh, died uh, last year. But he had kept these three copies of the three earliest scripts that Lee wrote when he was in his uh, late teens, early 20s, and programs. And uh, we tend not to keep things so much, but these sources, that was also just very moving that here's this friend who, who knew, who saw something, who believed in you and- Kept it, yeah. Yes, and supported through the years. Yeah, yeah. working on one's archives is really scary. It really <laughs> does, as you look at this stuff, it is really, petrifies you. <laughs> he did not like the juvenilia that was not uh, produced. He's like, oh, thank God that wasn't produced. <laughs> I think uh, visual artists are much better at archiving. <laughs> we theater people are in the moment. And uh, and in a way, yes, as you say, even the dollhouse it exists then only in that moment with Buddy on stage. It's not there when it's just somewhere in a script. Uh, like music, you know, it only exists even it's played, but it's written down. So it's this incredible, uh, mysterious, mysterious thing. So I think, yeah, and Ping Chong also talked about, he went through all his boxes and he says he's stunned about how many uh, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of projects uh, that never happened. And it's a time. Yes, you know, yes, it's amazing. Yes, all the ones that didn't happen. Yeah, and it's also something to, to, to think about. And, uh, but they are connected to the entire um, so um, it's a great thing, and I think also in theater and in theater history, it should be much more work on archives instead of the essays and the compositions and theoretical uh, reflections on work. I think it's uh, something that universities uh, and Yale does a great job, also part of NYU, to, to engage with the idea of the archive and then also find a way to perform it. So maybe one day you could do a work all the plays we never did and why, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which would be so funny to look at some of those early ones. <laughs> performing knowledge and performing uh, performing archives, um, which is which is a genre in itself. We're coming uh, closer um, um, to the end. 
what, what maybe for our listeners and also for the artists, what, what, how should we use this time? How should we think of this time? How should we give meaning this unprecedented time where we feel we live inside a catastrophe movie? So, but how, what should we do? What did you? Where did you guys find meaning? I mean, you touched on it, but still, as a as a way for young artists, maybe also, what should they focus on? What what's important? Oh, we're we supposed to be pundits now. I only can speak from like how we moved bit by bit. I think, of course, we're focused on health anyway, but uh, it seems you could tell how, and we've had friends who have, uh, and colleagues who have died from COVID. So there was a sense of how do you keep yourself healthy both mentally and physically and um we're both teetotalers now i know some people it's been the other way <laughs> but uh that's a that's a good feeling that's a cleansing um and we started doing uh well one of lee's sons started doing the Wim Hof exercises. And then they all started doing it. And then they were pressuring us to do it. And then Lee started and then I joined. And that's rather extraordinary. That's uh, these transformative things that can happen in a small space that you have control over inside your... And then there's the way that we've been walking around the neighborhood, looking, really looking at things. We just... And you feel a little silly sometimes that you have missed these things. I, we walk down the street, there's a redwood tree in our neighborhood. And we were always rushing before. We, we missed that tree. <laughs> so there's, there's pleasure in that. I, I think that, uh, I think it's hardest of course for young people who feel like, who oh, I'm becalmed, how do I? So I think you have to find different ways to feed yourself and not think of this as a, a, a dead time, but actually a, a replenishment. A, a reloading time. A reloading. A... Mm. Yeah, Lee, what do you think? You said reloading. Oh, I said reloading. Uh, I think well, looking being focused on the archives has jogged my memory in so many different ways. I started thinking about my memory and uh, I would like to write something about memory. And I started it and I've been working on it. It's uh, a very complicated idea of life in which the life is memory. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of theories of thinking that have to do with memory. Uh, they don't instantly come to mind. One of the problems about aging is things don't really come to mind the way they used to. <laughs> but memory is always there. And just the idea of jumping from image to image in my life uh, has always been an exciting moment for me. Uh, I remember just recently with all my kids, we took a trip down to the Shenandoah Valley where I grew up. I was eight or nine years old when I was there and we found the hotel that we lived in and it was still there. We found the second grade that I went to and that room was still there. And my memory became jogged and adjusted and things like that. And suddenly I, I was living in a different age. I just wasn't in the present anymore. And uh, I feel that art is in reality, 
or one aspect of it is escape art and looking for escapes uh, is a big part of where one goes for ideas. I think travel has been an enormous escape for us. Uh, escape for what? I don't know. <laughs> and escape to what? I don't know. But it's certainly a change of scene. It's turning the page. It's finding a new metaphor. Uh, well, I, it's freeing you from having to, to, to giving you a chance to see that there are different ways of living. That, because it's so easy to just be stuck in whatever your cultural milieu is. I think that one of the great things about now is the, the, the times, the insecurity of the times. Uh, I think that it's all kind of really exciting and really informative. I don't know what's going to happen at this point. I don't think anybody does, but it's just really exciting to follow it step by step by step by step. But it's also hard to take it too seriously because we've seen it all before. This is where memory comes in. I can remember the hundreds of demonstrations that I was part of, and I can remember what I felt. I can remember how I thought I was going to change the world at this time or that time and how the world didn't decide it was going to change uh, for me. And uh, I wonder about how all of this will ultimately uh, will it materialize in a different America. Will America emerge cleaner? Will it be more handleable? Uh, because here escape is possible, not anymore because we can't travel that way, but it always was an option to get out, to see something new, to try and Yes, so now you have to turn and deal with what is right here. Right. And whether the escape is internal, that's a big one. Can you manifest an internal escape? Uh, I think these are big questions, but they are enough to stay interested in. And I'm not quite so calm as Lee because of, I'm dealing more with the logistics of our life. But I think this is a good place to be at 83 in, in this. It's remarkable. And I think this is also very significant advice to be there to observe, to think about escape. As, you know, some people say Kafka's work is all about the exit. How do we get out? On the other hand, there's an internal life uh, that we have to escape from. And do we get out and connect to something deeper? Uh, yesterday also, um, Susanna Kennedy talked about that, that uh, she felt three sisters are caught in a loop and can't get out. They never get to Moscow. But what is that really? Is Moscow for them the Moscow? And she tried it to solve it with, with other questions. So it's really um, of, of great, great, great significance what you both uh, talked about and, and what you shared. And it will make us uh, think and uh, have better better questions. And Lee, congratulations. Also, you know about Lee also, you know, of your work, your body of work, what you created over decades and decades and decades. It's remarkable. It's extraordinary. And I'm sorry that you had to struggle so hard. I know when you came with some of the films to the Seagull and you were in the treatment and uh, it's, it's all what you are going through and what you think about, you know, and um, that your personal life coincides, coincides with what someone mentioned on the show, the idea the requiem for a species that potentially mankind might not survive. Yeah, yeah. This is just one of them. And but many, many reasons. It has never been really possible or thinking, but it's a different time now. And uh, but we all hope um, that uh, it will lead, as you said, to something that's a cleaning, that's changing, and we will 
we'll, we'll find some that is strong about we do not know it's a creational myth we have to make choices and we do not know where it is and we'll be in the middle of it so really both of you thank you thank you thank you for taking the time for taking the conversation so serious for sharing what's also not easy and hard and uh, thank you for being present and for being with us thank you likewise and Hard yeah. to and go through this. Congratulations thing. on this series. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That means means a lot to us. It's a small contribution, what we could do. And, uh, and uh, I wish um, uh, as theater artists like, like you are. Tomorrow we have Tiago Rodriguez from Portugal, a great director from Europe. We hear what he has to say and what he sings and how it is going in Portugal. And Caridad Switch will conclude this week of a. Uh, mm -hmm. Your experience as a Latinx uh, artist, writer, translator, essayist, journalist, and um, about this, uh, about this. And both of you, thank you. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us. Uh, VJ, Sia, and Travis, to San Young, and uh, Andy at the Seagull, and to listeners, thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, it is important. It's important for Lee and Maud to know um, that there are people out there who, who do care, who listen, who share the suffering, or the joyful suffering. Uh, the sharing of it and uh, in a joyful way and so we are theater artists are close to life but we deal with questions of death all the time and we have done it and you have done it since your very very early work so um, it is quite an extraordinary moment we live through so thank you and uh, hope to see you guys both and uh, it will be interesting to see what work will come out what will you produce and what uh, whether it is on screen or once there will be smaller spaces open up so I hope we will continue um, to see the extension um, of your mind and the memories that perhaps, as some people argue, they're not in our brain cells. How could it be? A liver can store images. Why should a brain people say, perhaps it's all stored outside and we just access it when we need it. So uh, fascinating ideas about dark matter and memories and, uh, and all of us. So thank you and uh, to our audience, really, thank you for listening and taking the time and out of the busy life I know how much uh, you all work and we all work perhaps so much more and have less time than we think so it's a very meaningful for us goodbye and both of you see you soon thank you thank you really really thank